Once upon a time, the parrot fish wasn't a fish at all, but a prince, a real prince. As even now, it's been considered as a lord, a lord of the Libyan seas and the South Aegean, at the bow of the lyre, between the islands of Crete, Cassos, Carpathos and Halki. Roots of timeless maritime trade since the Minoan times and exchange of ideas and materials. The islanders of these places, they call it red or white or brown, depending on the basic hue of the fish. It is both a fish for the poor and the fishermen, but also something that found its way to the banquets of Roman emperors. As an emigrating fish, it was emigrating every spring to the South Aegean from the coastal shores of Africa. A bulky fish, relatively easy to catch from the shore as well. At most basic, part of the fish is being cooked on charcoal, and the biggest secret according to those initiated with the ritual of it is to cook it whole with its entrails. The liver is apparently a delectable piquant meze. And generally, don't caught part of fish, they have clean entrails, as they're caught before they had time to graze. The fishermen, with a delicate move under the left wing, with their pocket knife, remove the bile and leave the rest intact. Of course, you can have them all removed, and fish, cooks and chefs roast them separately as a meze. The Flemish traveller, Olfred Dapper, noticed it and wrote about it extensively in the 17th century. A classic traditional recipe for part of fish is called papa plaqui, countless onions cut in slices and sauteed in plentiful olive oil, together with lots and lots of garlic, then deglazing them with generous amounts of uh, vinegar before adding copious amounts of super mature tomatoes, red and soft and juicy. Then the sauce gets cooked and emulsified in a wood fire, seasoned with salt and spicy hot paprika and cumin, reminding us perhaps of the recipes from Archestratus. Then the whole part of fish as one piece if it's a small one or in chunks if they're big, cook within the sauce. Another way for part of fish is the following. Salt and sun, sunshine and brine, the bright sun rays and the saltiness work together to cook as such and preserve the bounty of the Aegean. Firstly, the part of fish is opened spatchcocked style, then put in salt for a day, one more day in vinegar, then sun dried two or three days, and afterwards wrapped in a towel that could last during the winter in pots full of straw. When needed, it's cooked just as the Portuguese would cook with a salt cod with potatoes. Hello, my name is Thomas Dinas, and this is the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Welcome back to another week of uh, archaeogastronomical adventures. Greetings from a cold and rainy and grey August London. So let's dive head in to our ancient Mediterranean adventure for some sunshine and food. This is part three of uh, Archestratus Quotes. And it's the final one. And um, with this, we conclude our investigation of um, the quotes that are surviving from Archestratus in the text of Athena's Dipnos of Iste, of his book Hidipathia, or The Life of Luxury. You can find the quotes in, uh, in the Perseus Digital Library online. So if you go to www.perseus.tufts.edu, then you can search there for Archestratus uh, quotes or Athenos or whatever else you want. I'm currently reading the, the book Archestratus Fragments from the Life of Luxury by John Wilkins and Sean Hill, which has been published by Prospect Books. So this uh, book has all the quotes and analysis and commentary and um, more in-depth investigation and examination of these quotes and the ancient Greek uh, food. So yeah, overall it's very interesting. If you have the chance, uh, get your hands into it. Fragment 39, Athenaeus 284e. Let our fine Olpian inquire why Archestratus and his fine councils says of preserved fish in the Bosporus, the whitest that set sail from the Bosporus. But let there be no addition of the hard flesh of the fish which grows in the Maiotic lake, 
the fish which is not lawful to mention in verse. What is this fish that um, we cannot mention in verse? Most likely it's a sturgeon. Myotic Lake is the Sea of Azov today and it's a pretty much a sturgeon territory there. And it was a quality ingredient in the salt fish uh, processing. Ancient Greeks obviously ate a lot of salted fish. It was one of the main methods to preserve uh, food uh, back in the ancient times all over the world. And yeah, as fish was quite plentiful in the Black Sea and um, there was that trade between the Black Sea, Greek colonies and mainland Greece, especially Athens. We do get all these passages about salted fish and and sturgeon from up there, from uh, the Myotic Lake or Azov Sea, is of very good quality. And um, the whiteness in salt was highly prized as well. Hence, we have the comment about the whitest that set sail from Bosporus. Fragment 40, Athenaeus 314e. Achestratus says, but get a slice of swordfish when you come to Byzantium, the very joint of the tail. It is also good in the strait near the jutting headland of Pelorum. Who is such a careful tactician or such a judge of tasty foods as this poet from Mugella, or should I say Katagila? Okay, <laughs> that's another interesting one. Um, the joke with uh, Gela and Katagelan, I guess that means to laugh uh, derisively. So again, that comes from uh, Aristophanes, uh, his comedy Acarnians. So again, here we have uh, a claim about swordfish and about the tail of it. Uh, Byzantium, obviously we know where it is. It's modern day Istanbul. And Pelorum is... Um, at the other opposite end of um, Archestratus' world. So Pelorum is uh, the promontory in the northeastern strip uh, of Sicily. So we do have those two kind of ends, in a sense, of the Greek world, that, um, in a sense, opposite places of the Greek world that you can find delicious swordfish. Fragment 41. Athenaeus 320a. Archestratus, in his gastronomy, the parrotfish, Scaros, should be obtained from Ephesus. In winter, eat a red mallet, caught in the sandy Tehiusa, a village of Miletus near the Carians with the crooked limbs. So the parrotfish we explored before, Scaros, a very tasty fish, and um, even nowadays it's been fished um, in um, modern Greece, as we've seen in the introduction. But we're also talking about the red mallet, which is uh, seasonal in that uh, area. And the reference to Carians, which uh, with their crooked limbs, is a parody of the Homeric Carians, the Paconians, with their crooked bows. Fragment 42, Athenaeus 325d. The very knowledgeable Archestratus praises the red mallets of Tehiusa in Miltus, and then says, and in Thassos too, buy a red mallet, and you will get one no worse than a Tehiusa mallet. It is worse on Teos, so even that is good. At Erythrae, they are good if handed by the shore. So all four locations, Thassos, Tichiusa, and Teos and Erythrae, appear to produce quality red mallet. And the last three are in the southern half of uh, the western coast of Asia Minor. Uh, the closest parallel in Archestratus for the grouping of locations that are near to each other is, uh, is on fragment 13, as we've seen, on Byzantium and Halkidon. And as in fragment 41, just before, the shore of Aterithrae is favoured for catching mallet. And generally there was um, a great enthusiasm about um, a red mallet in the ancient world, especially between uh, Roman authors. There was, there was a lot about a red mallet. It was one of those uh, highly prized fish in the ancient Mediterranean. Fragment 43, Athenaeus 307d. The fine Archestratus says grey mallet Buy it from a Gina, which the sea flows round, and you will share the company of smart men. Basically here, Archestratus tells us to go to a Gina, an island um, which is um, in the Saronic Gulf, uh, so like um, southwest of Athens and Piraeus and Salamina, and tells you go to the market there and get a fish, a grey mallet. And I guess uh, saying about the company of smart men, uh, he means that smart men buy their grey mallet from Egina, so if you do the same, you are in their company. Fragment 44, Athenaeus 313f. Archestratus, the author of Life of Luxury. The grey mallet is amazing when winter comes. So Athenaeus is quoting here from Lynceus of Samos, The Art of Marketing, 
who says quotations of this kind from Archestratus may be used to beat down the fishmonger's prices if the fish is out of season. The grey mallets of uh, Sinope are said by Galen to be excellent because of the rivers flowing into the Black Sea, which create in their deltas lakes like the sea. Here Athenaeus represents Archestratus as greedy and having an unhealthy interest in fish heads. These criticisms are clearly based on criteria other than taste, texture and nourishment. On head meat, and we have Athenaeus 342DE compared to this passage above, it is excessive gluttony to snatch food while still eating, and this particularly applies to the head of the grey mallet, unless those who are clever in this area know of something useful in the mallet's head. That is the sort of thing that the greediness of Archestratus could reveal to us. And again in 307b, Amazing are the mallets caught of Abdera, as Archestratus has said. Second are the mallets of Sinope. And we see here from Archestratus, winter is the best time for grey mallets, and uh, autumn in the medical writer Xenocrates and in Aristotle is the best time for them to catch uh, mallets. Fragment 45, Athenaeus 311a. The wise Archestratus, when you come to Miletus, get from the guests on Mars a cephalos type grey mallet and a Sibas, Labrax, one of the children of the gods, that is where they are the best. Such is the nature of the place. There are many other fatter ones in famous Calydon, in wealth bearing Ambrachia, and in Lake Bolby. But they do not have the fragrant fat of the belly or such pungent fat. The Milesian, my friend, are amazing in their excellence. They scale them and bake them whole until tender in salt. When working on this delicacy, do not let any Syracusan or Italian come near you, for they do not understand how to prepare good fish. They ruin them in a horrible way by cheesing everything and sprinkling with a flow of vinegar and silphium pickle. When it comes to thrice cursed rockfish, they are the best of all at seeing to them intelligently, and they can bring clever ideas in a smart way to a banquet. Little dishes which are cheap and sticky and based on nonsensical seasoning. I love this passage. The judgment here of Archestratus about uh, the puns and fat and so on, it's very similar and very close to Galen's uh, remarks about the sea cephalos, which says the flesh being less fat and more pungent and sweeter. Again, we see Archestratus including consideration about the fat content and the quality of the fat. And the marshes of Geshun is, uh, was just north of Miletus, the ancient Greek city in the Asia Minor coast. And it was joined by the sea. And it tells us about um, the lake variety as well. As we see the Lake Volvi, which is in North Greece. And the sea bus is similar, according to Galen, and inhabits estuaries and waters between salt and fresh uh, water, as we have on the passage above. And the choice is here between simply cooking for good quality fish and sauces based on cheeses for lesser fish, which um, we've seen also before in fragment 36. That in fragment 36, and you see the distinction here tell, telling us don't let it go near any Sicilian because they will ruin the fish with uh, cheese sauces. Sibas, uh, whose Greek name is Labrax, as we said earlier, is one of the most favorite fish for consumption uh, both in, in the ancient world and in today's world. The Sicilians generally were associated with uh, lavish dining and uh, this reputation continued into the Roman period as well. And uh, Cicero, for example, and his friends appeared to enjoy salt fish with a cheese sauce. So here, in attacking Archestratus, in attacking uh, Syracusans and Italians, he appears to be advocating a style of cooking different from that prevailing at the time, which was strong in flavor. Cheese, vinegar, silphium, and so on. And of course, expensive. Such a style is uh, for rockfish, like parrotfish, and not uh, suitable for a delicate and delicious fish as Sibas. Fragment 46, Athenaeus 319d. Selachians, now famous Miletus, nurtures the best. But why talk of the file fish or the broad back ray? I would as soon dine on oven baked crocodile in which the children of the Ionians take delight. So Selachi is uh, the rays, and perhaps with uh, the words file fish, they talk about angel fish which is the most skate-like of the sharks. And, um, and basically here we have perhaps a passage that uh, gives us the low estimation of which uh, rays fall into like um, dining um, on lizards and crocodiles, not uh, some delicious 
fish. Fragment 47, Athenaeus 286D. On the frogfish, the incredibly wise Archestratus advises us as follows in his words of wisdom. The frogfish, whenever you see one, buy and prepare the belly section. So, frogfish is almost certainly one of the monkfish or anglerfish, and um, here is called the, the belly section is what we call the tail in modern English usage. So the underbelly is chosen um, as usual, and um, obviously we see here, it's, again, the best and tastiest part of uh, the fish. Fragment 48, Athenaeus 314D. Archestratus says, And an electric ray, boiled in oil and wine, fragrant leaves and a little grating of cheese. So yeah, we have the standard treatment of cheese, herbs, oil and wine which is usually not appreciated by Archestratus. What is interesting is not so much that he uses it here, with an inferior fish such as uh, Electric Ray, but that he chooses to discuss and advise on such inferior produce in the first place. I don't think nowadays we would, we would eat Electric Ray. I don't think it's um, considered edible, but um, happy to be corrected otherwise if anyone knows better. Fragment 49. And eat a boiled ray in the season of midwinter, and with it cheese and silphium. This is the method of preparation for any children of the deep which have a flesh that is not fatty. I now declare this for the second time. So again, we see here not uh, fatty or dry fish uh, with um, lean uh, meat recommended for um, cheese and silphium and other sauces. Fragment 50, Athenaeus 304d. The dolphin fish of Charistus is the best. As a general rule, Charistus is a place with excellent fish supplies. So dolphin fish, it's very interesting because it could mean the brims and not, um, not the actual dolphins themselves, to be honest. And um, it seems Charistus is the town in the southern UB island and the, the general praise of the sea of Charistus, in which is in the form of a very large bay and can be set beside attestations for Anthendon, Eretria and Halkis in the Evripus channel between Evia and the mainland. Fragment 51. Archestratus says the Latus is best in Italy. The Latus, the Straits of Scylla, are home to the famous Latus in much wooded Italy, an amazing fish. So Latus is the great Nile perch, Archestratus appears to describe a related but smaller fish in the Straits of Messina, and he declares to be a gourmet fish. This is a notable illustration of Archestratus' area of operation, the coast of Italy, Sicily and Greece, the Aegean, the Black Sea. The Nile perch is the best of the Nile fish, but Egypt is not under consideration, and so a lesser Italian equivalent is preferred. I'll be back after this short break. Today's episode is brought to you with the welcome support of Malbin Greek, UK's leading Greek delicatessen, supplier and distributor of premium Greek produce. Whatever you need, Malbin Greek has you covered. You can shop online and have the divine and delicious goods delivered to your doorstep across the UK, or you can visit the shop at Art17 Apollo Business Park, Lucy Way, SC16, 4ET. Bermondsey, London. Malby and Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix. Hello there, sorry to interrupt. My name's Dr Neil Buttery and I'm host of the British Food History Podcast, a podcast that you, as a fan of The Delicious Legacy, might be interested in. I explore British food and its history in all its glory, with interviews with special guests, recipes, reenactments, and tracking down forgotten recipes and hyper-regional specialities. Previous topics include medieval eels, 18th century dining, curry, London street food sellers, breakfast, and the good old Yorkshire pudding. Search for the British Food History Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And now, back to the delicious legacy. Cheers. Fragment 52. Athenaeus 313F. Mormirus. The inshore Mormirus is a bad fish and never good. It's not very clear here if all Mormirus are bad or the ones uh, inshore only. It seems to be one of the brim fish, the lesser brims, not the gillhead, of course, that we still love and know. And the medical author Hicetius judges them very nourishing, apparently. And this is probably a further example of Archestratus citing a fish that is not on the gourmet list. So basically, like something that is not just for gourmands, but for everyday people as well. Fragment 53, Athenaeus 318f. Octopus, the best are in Thassos and Caria. Corfu also grows a great number, many of a good size, octopus and dogfish. Fragment 54, Athenaeus 326d. 
Archestratus, who travelled round all lands and seas to satisfy his gluttony, says, Squids are to be found in Dium of Pieria by the surge of Bafira, and in Ambracia you'll see very many. Dion is um, it's an amazing archaeological site nowadays, and it's in Pieria uh, at the bottom of uh, Mount, Mount Olympus. And yes, Archestratus tells us to go there for great um, squid. You'll find uh, some decent seafood around the area as well, some nice mussels nowadays. And of course, uh, Ambrachia again, once again, is mentioned in the west coast of Greece. And um, in the Athenos text, there's a comic recipe for squid stuffed with uh, green leaves just straight after this passage. Fragment 55. Athenos 324b. The greatest polymath Archestratus says cuttlefish in Abdera and also in mid Maronia. So Abdera and Maronia, they are in Thrace, in modern day Thrace, the coast of Thrace. Interesting that mentions only from there. Fragment 56. And Archestratus says in gastronomy, mussels. Aenus produces large mussels, abidus oysters, parium small cigales, mytilene scallops. Ambrachia too supplies many. And with them, enormous dot dot dot. Part of the text I guess is missing. And in the narrow strait of Messina, enormous conge. And in Ephesus, you'll get smooth clams that are not at all bad. There are Tethia at Halkidon and heralds. May Zeus destroy them, both the seaborn and the inhabitants of the assembly. One man accepted. That man is my comrade. He lives in Lesbos with its many grapes and he's called Agathon. This is quite funny, actually. So we have a description of places that produce great seafood. We have our uh, seagulls and mussels and oysters and scallops. We don't know what uh, the conge are, per se, and also we don't know what the tethea from Halkedon are. But we know what he calls heralds. We know that it's the general term for whelk and that its flesh is tough. So that's why he curses them and says, may just destroy them. But also the real heralds, the ones in the town, so this is, has a comedic value as well. Basically, both are worthless. Human town heralds and the whelks. Of course, unless one is your friend. And that one is Agathon. Fragment 57. Athenaeus 399d. On the hair, Archestratus, the Daedalus of tasty cooking, says as follows. The hair. There are many ways and many laws for the preparation of it. Now the best way is to bring the meat roasted to each guest during the drinking. It should be hot, simply sprinkled with salt and taken from the spit while it is still a little undercooked. Do not let it distress you to see the divine ichor dripping from the meat, but eat it greedily. All other methods are mere sidelines to my mind. Thick sauces poured over, cheese melted over, too much oil over, as if they were preparing a tasty dish of dogfish. An excellent passage here, a fantastically simple but realistic recipe, and a way and a method of cooking hair, which uh, corresponds to our tastes as well. Slightly pink, the meat of um, game needs to be slightly pink. And tells you here, don't be afraid of little blood, ichor, which here for uh, poetic purposes uses the word ichor, which is the the divine liquid that flows in the veins of the gods. But yeah, we see here, okay, have it a little undercooked with the juices, just sprinkle some salt, doesn't need anything else. If you have a nice fresh hair, nothing else matters. And eat it as a measure, eat it with your drink while you have your drinking uh, hour. And the slightly interesting thing here is that it doesn't give you any provenance where you, you will find the best hair as uh, he does with fish and vegetables. Fragment 58. Archestratus, in his much vaunted poem, feed up the young goose and prepare it also for simple roasting. Again, we have a, a very simple um, a reference, a very a rare reference in uh, poultry here, and tells us the goose just simply roasted, just as we do with a hare. The advice is to take the ingredient and just roast it, leave it as it is, no sauces or garnishes. Fragments 59 and 60, Athenaeus 29b. 
from Archestratus, the writer of Banquets, then when you have drawn a full measure of Zeus the Saviour, you must drink an old wine with a really grey old head, its moist locks festooned with white flowers, born in Lesbos, with the sea all around. I praise Biblian wine from Phoenicia, though it does not equal lesbian. If you take a quick taste of it, and are previously unacquainted, it will seem to you to be more fragrant than the lesbian, for this lasts for a very long time. When tasted it though, it is very inferior, and the lesbian will take on a rank not like wine but like ambrosia. If some scoff at me, braggarts, purveyors of empty nonsense, saying that Phoenician has the sweetest nature of all, I pay no attention to them. Thassos also produces a noble wine to drink, provided it is aged over many good seasons down the years. I know too of the shoots dripping with grape clusters in other cities. I could cite them, praise them, and indeed their names are well known to me. But the others are simply worthless beside the lesbian wine. Some people, of course, like to praise products from their own locality. That's an excellent passage about uh, wine provenance and terroir. Don't you think? Two and a half thousand years old. On our episode for uh, the history of wine, especially in ancient Greece, we saw we saw that Greece Greece had lots and of different varieties of wines, and of course, different places um, produced wine differently. So different methods, different grapes, and obviously different terroir, as we know, and especially the islands. So most of the Greek islands had a great reputation for wine in, in antiquity. So if you go back to the episode about uh, the history of wine, then uh, yeah, you'll find in more detail about uh, about Greek wines. The notable thing here is that um, the praise for Phoenician wine from, uh, if we say modern day Lebanon, roughly, uh, where we still get uh, some pretty great um, wines. Fragment 61, Athenaeus 4D. Archestratus from Syracuse, or Gela, says, All should dine at a single table set on an elegant meal. In all, the diners should be three or four, and certainly no more than five. Otherwise, it will be a tent full of soldiers, mercenaries and looters of foodstuffs. So here we kind of move from uh, the food per se, the dishes, and we're talking about the table manners and the etiquette of the meal and, and the dinner itself. And here it tells us, you just need three or four friends maximum to have a great time and great food and a great dinner. Fragment 62. Athenaeus 101b. Archestatus, the Daedalus of cooking, speaks of soul's womb after the dinner and the toasts and the anointing with perfumes. Always festoon the head with all kinds of garland at the feast, with whatever the fruitful floor of the earth brings into flower. Dress your hair with fine distilled perfumes and all day long throw on soft ashes, myrrh and incense, the fragrant fruit of Syria. And while you are drinking, let these tasty dishes be brought to you, the belly and boiled womb of a sow, in cumin and sharp vinegar and silphium. The tender race of roasted birds, whatever may be in season, have nothing to do with those Syracusians who drink only in the manner of frogs and eat nothing. No, do not be taken in by them, but eat the foods I set forth. All those other trigemata are a sign of wretched poverty, boiled chickpeas, broad beans, apples and dried figs. I do so upload the flat cake born in Athens. If you cannot get one there, go and get one elsewhere and seek out some Attic honey, for that is what makes it flaunt itself proudly. That is how a free man should live. The alternative is to go beneath the earth at the bottomless pit of Tartarus to destruction and be dug down countless states deep. <laughs> I, love, I love this passage. So we have uh, this extravagant thing, sow's womb, with uh, sharp vinegar and cumin and silphium. This is something that Archestratus places at the end of the meal with the other trigemata. So the little taste dishes uh, at the end of the feast. And those can be sweet or savory, of course. And um, that's why we have this... Um, this kind of thing about talking about dried figs and all these uh, boiled chickpeas and all these poor substitutes. And of course, we have a detailed uh, description of how to dress uh, incenses and perfumes and all the stuff that happened during uh, the feast, the dinner, how it should be. And I love, of course, the criticism of the Syracusans that they drink uh, without any food. And uh, yeah, they're kind of 
uh, uncouth. Despite all we know, and despite the quotes that we have surviving here and there, and Archestratus' name mentioned in a few different other texts surviving from uh, antiquity, I can't help but think of him as a semi-mythical figure, really. Who was he? A chef? A traveller? A merchant? A philosopher? A poet? All of the above? Some of the above? I'm not sure sure anymore. And yet, I like to imagine him as the first of uh, many, many curious food explorers and writers and champions of uh, the many variations of food and drink that we get uh, all over the world. A character from history that can appreciate the local produce, the fresh produce, at the right time, at the right place. And with that, praise the insider's knowledge, the local knowledge, and appreciate the culture and the recipe and the people who themselves made this dish possible. And this is it. That's today's episode about um, Archestratus' quotes in Athenos. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed um, our trilogy and um, this will give you an inspiration to try some sort of recipes from from Archestatus. And um, yeah, let me know how you're getting on. It will be interesting to see some of it recreated um, and how they taste actually, because um, it's extremely difficult, to be honest, to try and recreate a recipe from Archestatus quotes, because they're not exact recipes, are they? They're just ingredients, where to find the best ones and some vague instructions on uh, cooking and um, and how to eat it or how not to eat it. So nothing that doesn't tell us anything about the flavor itself and how long it needs cooking and exact portions and ingredients. So as with everything else, it's a mystery. It's an enigma. It's something that you need to tweak and uh, bring it to your own personal palate. The obstacles on our path of recreating engine dishes are many. Yet, don't despair. Try and work it out yourself, for yourself, and also find out some uh, traditional recipes from around the Mediterranean. So dishes that, just like the parrot fish recipe that I gave you in the beginning of this episode, there is a timeless quality in it. It feels like it could have been from many thousands of years ago, except the tomatoes, of course. And of course, another difficulty on recreating these dishes is that um, the ingredients themselves have changed. It's very difficult to try and think that the barley and the wheat and the wine and the vinegar and the grapes and the olives and the olive oil all stayed the same for two and a half thousand years. Nothing stayed the same. Uh, Things evolve, uh, new strains uh, are created, we use um, bigger, more efficient um, wheat and barley and grapes and so on. So all that stuff changes all the time. So what one description from 2,000 years ago might seem to remind us something today, it could be, of course, something completely different. My own sort of recipe uh, from uh, Kestratus is um, fillets of tuna, line coat tuna. Also, again, I do not recommend that because it can be very endangered species. But I've got the fillets of tuna uh, in, um, in a crust made of uh, fresh herbs. So freshly chopped oregano, mint, parsley, and coriander. So these four herbs finely chopped with some um, cumin, some cumin um, seeds uh, grinded, all mixed together, make a crust on the fish and um, place it in an uh, oven roasting dish with olive oil, put it in the oven, cook it, and then at the end just drizzle some uh, white wine vinegar. I'll put a recipe for that on my Patreon. Okay, that's it. Thank you. And see you next week for more Archaeological Gastronomical Adventures. Bye for now.